Hi, I'm Rihanna Dalewal. I'm a researcher in residence for the year-long residency program of non-extractive architecture at the VAZ Zatare in Venice, Italy. This interview is a part of a series of conversations that we are having for the non-extractive architecture project, which consists of a research residency and exhibition in Venice at the VAZ Zatare and a series of conversations and guest lectures that attempt to question the possibility of a non-extractive practice of architecture. So far, the research has taken a very broad approach to understanding extraction in architecture. We have investigated the extraction of raw materials from their sources, but we are also interested in other forms of immaterial extraction, such as the extraction of value, culture, labor, and knowledge. We believe that non-extractive architecture requires a shared concern for humans, but also for the other than human species, and hope that an architecture can facilitate the necessary role of care for both humans, other than humans, and the environment. Today, we have the pleasure to speak with Feral Partnerships, a collective that includes Matthew Dharma Paul, James Powell, Enrico Brondelli di Brondello, and Beth Fisher Levine. Feral Partnerships is a collaboration board, born out of frustration with professional and academic practice standards in architecture around eco ecological and biodiversity loss. Their research project entitled The Architecture of Multi-Species Cohabitation creates an archive of buildings designed for humans and other species in order to inspire new possibilities for building worlds with the other than human in mind. The work has been presented at the Pollen Biennial Conference 2020 and the London Festival of Architecture 2021 and was a subject of a solo exhibition at the University of Sydney's Tin Sheds Gallery from April to June 2021. So Feral Partnerships, thank you for joining us today. So before we start our Q&A session, Feral Partnerships will give a short presentation exploring case studies through the lens of non-extractive architecture, exploring the extractive or in some cases non-extractive relationships they facilitate between humans and other species. So now I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, we're really pleased to be able to share some of our work and thinking with you today. So, um, and thank you for inviting us to, to share that with you today. Um, as you said in our introduction, um, our collaboration really grew from this frustration with what we perceived as a lack of response within architecture, within practice, as well as in academia, um, to this ongoing crisis of biodiversity loss uh, that we're facing. Um, this frustration came not only from the fact that between us, we have a genuine care and interest in the welfare of other than human species on their own terms. Um, we believe that non-human lives have an intrinsic value to their, to their own. Um, but also because by looking at architecture through the lens of the other than human species, um, it really opens up some fundamental questions about, about architecture that, that we need to be asking. Um, you know, fundamentally, what, who's architecture for? Um, what, what does sustainability mean in terms of its mainstream conception? Um, are technical solutions and efficient building technologies really enough to lead us out of crisis? Or are these just shifting the loci of extraction um, to new territories? With the framing of non-extractive architecture in mind, we'll present some case studies from our recent research project, The Architecture of Multi-Species Cohabitation, which was recently exhibited in Sydney in collaboration with uh, Francesca Rausser and also the Sydney Environment Institute. This project began as a research archive of multi-species cohabitation as a way to begin to crystallise an approach to non-extractive architecture um, and to begin to open up paths into the sorts of generous multi-species worlds that we were interested in. Um, through the lens of multi-species cohabitation we can tease out how each architecture speaks um, of certain relations between humans, between human and non-humans, um, with each of which illustrate various points on a spectrum from extraction to forms of independence or partnerships between species. Our research began with an analysis of farmhouses to identify certain socio-technological shifts that have led to the separation of humans and non-human animals. Um, in domestic spaces over time. It's easy to forget in the context of uh, contemporary Western society that historically we've, we've lived alongside other species in the domestic space, 
um, for thousands of years. We did a series of studies looking at the role of cattle animals in the development of farmhouse design over time. And what that says about a really uh, dramatic ramping up of extractive relationships with other species. For example, in the medieval longhouse, cattle were given the space within the home and often that role reflected their social significance as sort of prized chattel, prized possessions. By the 20th century, cattle have moved out of the domestic sphere and into this industrial feedlot, um, reflecting their rendering as merely metabolic machines. Moreover, this isolation is really key and part, part of a kind of drastic loss of popular engagement with the non-human lives that make human lives possible. And this really reinforces extractive attitudes and in the population at large towards animals. Um, this historical context also reveals kind of how by prefiguring the non-extractive architecture, we're also to some extent reclaiming lost histories that we've had. Um, similarly, our other case studies opened up various non-extractive worlds um, that are today either rare or threatened. The Greek island of Tinos, located in the Cyclades archipelago, contains over 1,000 highly ornate homes for pigeons known as peristeriones. In feudal times, Phoenician traders learned to domesticate the birds for their meat, lubricating fat, communication capabilities, and nutrient-rich manure used as fertilizer, bringing them to landscapes around the Mediterranean. Situated amidst arable fields, reliant on their precious holdings, these dovecotes were expressed as miniature castles, drawing upon medieval motifs used to express social status and function. These buildings once organized vast terracing landscapes, connecting the metabolism of pigeons who consume nutrient-rich seafood to those of humans who rely on pigeon fertilizer for their produce. Before being cast down as rats of the sky, the pigeon was best known for its ability to return home from long distances. As early as 2500 BC, pigeons were reliable messengers for a variety of human affairs. Because of the magnetic receptors in their beaks, pigeons can travel long distances with incredible accuracy, relying on the Earth's magnetic field and other cues in the landscape. While pigeon rearing and racing remains a popular practice around the world, the dovecote and nutrient-rich soils they facilitated became redundant with the rise of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides chemicals which are unintentionally producing infertility in creatures of all kinds. We modeled this dovecote in Istahan, Iran, in order to understand how the building responds to the scales of the human and pigeon body and how the vaulted construction allows these multiple scales to come together in one structure. In these towering dovecotes, care has been taken to exclude natural predators, and there are often small and corbelled elements that keep snakes from being able to climb up and inside the structure. In exchange for providing pigeons shelter and sometimes food through these structures, humans receive enriched food, communication capabilities, and companions. So our next example is situated um, on the shores of Lake Biwa, um, which more specifically is uh, in the Takashima prefecture in uh, northern Japan. And we are interested in this particular village um, called Harie, um, which is located on the edge of an alluvial fan, um, which in geological terms means that there's lots of groundwater upwelling to the surface. And um, people living in this landscape have learned to harvest it uh, in very particular and, and sort of canny ways. Um, and interestingly, they sort of build um, what uh, they call kabatas, sort of wooden structures around these springs. Um, usually they are part of a domestic setting, but some of them are shared um, between different households and, and therefore sort of accessible from the street. Um, the water coming from the ground is um, maintained at a steady temperature of sort of 13 to 15 degrees uh, all year round. And, and is therefore sort of the perfect setting for, um, for example, residents to keep their produce, uh, fruit, fruit and vegetables, um, in the summer. So there's a first basin that is sort of where the water is at its purest, it's sort of straight out of the ground, and then it sort of descends into a series of basins and 
and then back into a canal system. And uh, what we're particularly interested in is the second basin where lots of residents um, keep fish. And although originally uh, these carbs would have been you know, meant for eating the food, they are now uh, thought of as pets. And, and they play a crucial role in this sort of system um, because they, by, by feeding off the food scraps of you know, people coming to clean their pots and pans, um, they sort of um, keep the, the water of the Kavata crystal clear. And have therefore forged this um, interesting alliance um, with you know, the residents. And, and what we particularly enjoy is that because fish and humans in this town share a resource, water, um, humans have learned to become particularly uh, attentive to their local ecology and to the ways in which um, you know, their lives are entangled with, with uh, the landscape to live in and, and, and sort of the, the ecosystem they inhabit. Um, they're not using um, harsh chem chemicals anymore, for example, and they are trying to bring back um, this sort of ancient um, water harvesting system. And finally, on the non-extractive end of the spectrum, we find architectures which create settings and moments for non-productive interspecies encounters. These are typically framed by sanctity, communication, delight and play. This is exemplified by a number of multi-species case studies from the Ottoman era. Turkish academic Professor Ekrem Bora Akinji describes how the people of the Ottoman era would summarise faith as respecting the words of Allah and his creatures and therefore did not overlook animals when helping those in need. This belief manifested in a number of novel architectural typologies. Sculpted plate-shaped stone pavers could be found in front of residential buildings, which city dwellers would fill with food scraps and water for stray dogs, cats, and urbanized birds. Ornate birdhouses adorn the facades of important civic buildings and structures, including mosques, bridges, libraries, and schools. Many were conceived as complex multi-level structures in the style of palatial Ottoman architecture and were elevated so as to receive sunlight and minimize human disturbance. The world's first animal hospital is thought to be the Gurbani e Latlan, or House of Injured Storks, built in Bursa, Turkey in the 1800s. The site was chosen for its location along the intercontinental bird migration path. Storks with injured legs, wings or eyes were cared for and set free when cured. The urban environment was animated by this culture of care. Foundations were established to protect a number of different species, many of which operated from civic buildings. These include street cat foundations at the Kedla Mosque in Damascus and the Istanbul National Library, a shelter for old and injured donkeys and horses at the University of Damascus, and a stork fostering initiative at the Demish Yemi Mosque. These examples force us to question how architecture might facilitate a shift from mere temporary spectacles to sustain commitments of care in the context of the city. Thank you for the amazing presentation. So now we'll go into the questions. So the first question is, in your bio, you explain that feral partnerships was formed through a collective frustration with professional and academic architectural practices towards ecological and biodiversity loss. However, through your exploration and research, have you come across any examples of ecological legislation or policy that protects or and or cares for other than human species? Thanks, Rihanna, for the question. Um, so through our research, we've obviously discovered a number of exciting case studies um, throughout the course of history. Um, but this wasn't necessarily um, an easy task. And it's been particularly difficult to find contemporary examples of eco ecologically led architecture. And whilst policy and legis legislation relating to ecology exists, um, the level of protection or care that this affords to other species is questionable. Um, and we believe current UK legislation specifically um, is too weak to champion biodiversity in practice. And we see this in the exclusion of other than human stakeholders um, from architectural discourse today. 
Um, so this is a bit UK centric, but this is just based on our experience. And we'd obviously love to learn about how these things work in other countries. But mm. in the context of everyday architectural practice in the UK, um, duties towards other species are primarily prescribed um, in two areas of policy. So industry codes of conduct and national planning policy. So with regards to professional codes in the UK, all registered architects are subject to the ARB code of conduct and um, members of their REBA are also bound by the REBA code of professional conduct. And with regards to biodiversity, um, both codes include one or two brief, vaguely worded clauses which touch on matters of biodiversity. Um, but we don't believe that either code is sufficiently robust to hold practitioners to account for the ecological impact of their work, um, nor to empower professionals who want to act in the interests of the natural environment against the interests of the client. Um, the most explicit reference to biodiversity is found in the REBA Code of Con Conduct. Uh, it's duty 13.2 if anyone wants to look at it. Um, and this implies that specialist ecological um, advice is unnecessary in some, some circumstances. So we obviously think that that guidance is counterproductive. And it's also symptomatic of a fraught planning process, um, which brings us to the next point. Um, the majority of architects practicing in the UK will have some engagement with matters of biodiversity at the planning stage of a project. And planning policy stipulates that architects must declare whether biodiversity features may be affected by their proposals um, when applying for planning permission. Um, and where this is the case, they'll typically commission an ecologist uh, to conduct surveys required uh, for the validation of the planning application. And it's the local authority's planner's duty to assess ecological information submitted um, with planning applications in the process of making decisions. Um, but worryingly, many local authority, uh, many local authorities don't currently have the competence um, or capacity to adequately assess um, planning applications where biodiversity is a material consideration. The vast majority of planning authorities in England don't have um, an in-house ecologist and, you know, something like nine out of 10 local authority planners um, have no ecological qualifications, very little training and consequently they don't have you know the levels of ecological knowledge required um, in you know their discharging of these duties and national policy um, so i mean you can imagine that these judgments made you know in the absence of proper ecological expertise um, have the potential to be just catastrophic for wildlife um, and there's also a speciesism inherent to the planning process, um, which requires consideration for protected and priority species only. Protected species being those protected by law and priority species being those um, requiring conservation locally, um, but which are not pr strictly protected by law. And if there's no evidence of these, um, and these represent less than 5% of species in the UK um, on or around the proposal site, no ecological survey or specialist advice is required. And you know, this obviously creates a potential for plants and animals that are integral to local ecosystems um, to be harmed in, in the course of development proceedings. And uh, because planning policy affords them no protection if they fall outside these two categories. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of incoming policy, um, in 2019, the UK government introduced the Environment Bill 2020, which is presented as an effort to place the environment at the forefront of policy making. And that includes um, the strengthening of planning policy. And the bill features a new requirement um, for developments to develop uh, to demonstrate 10% uh, net gains um, in biodiversity, which is either delivered on site, off site, or through a combination of the two. Um, which sounds sounds good in practice, but um, you know, in reality, this form of development has a potential to legitimise like ecological destruction um, under a veil of greenwashing, really. So we're seeing this in the construction of housing developments um, on greenfield sites, um, because what it's allowing you to do is you know destroy and displace um, natural landscapes sometimes miles and miles away from their um, original location on the basis of dubious metrics um, mm. that, are, that are disputed by um, ecologists. Um, and finally, I should also mention that the building regulations have been completely silent on matters of biodiversity. So nothing to say there. <laughs> so 
with all of this in mind, um, architects um, have got to be aware that we can't rely on current legislation mm -hmm. um, to protect wildlife. Um, and we just need to acknowledge our agency that we hold in, you know, reorganizing landscapes and ecosystems and, you know, take, take initiative um, to understand and elevate other than human intelligence and stakeholders. I think the end part when you're talking about the agency of architects kind of links very well to the next question. So when we think of environmental justice, we inherently think of these legislative and political practices and attempt to redesign these systems and to become more encompassing to these injustices. However, as architectural designers and spatial practitioners, where do you see your agency lying within these conversations and where do you see yourself making the biggest impact? Yeah, I mean, as Beth said, um, our current legislative frameworks and kind of political frameworks are at least in the UK really weak and end up being a hindrance more than help in the kind of fight towards biodiversity loss. Um, with your kind of your clients and your planning bodies inherently kind of looking at these legislative frameworks as a kind of minimal, minimum achievable aim a lot of the time, it's often really hard to push beyond that um, in practice and argue that these kind of legislations aren't fit for purpose and we need to be looking beyond them. Um, so I guess, of course, it's tempting to use whatever agency that we have as kind of architects as a whole um, to kind of lobby these political and, and legislative bodies um, and trying to have an impact on that level. Um, interestingly, we've we've kind of seen over the last um, couple of years, the emergence of organisations such as um, Extinction Rebellion is an obvious one, there's Architects Climate Action Network, um, which is kind of these forms of extra professional activism that try and speak truth to power effectively on topics such as um, uh, climate change, but also biodiversity loss in, in the kind of work of XR, for example. Um, and I, I guess more directly linked to the kind of production of architectural work are these kind of, there's a, in the UK as well, there's kind of recently formed um, sector for architectural workers in the union, UVW saw, um, which as well as being set up to kind of systematically fight extractive employment practices within the workplace and the, within the actual production of work. Um, as part of that, there's also kind of conversations about what um, collectivizing architectural workers might mean in terms of taking ground up action um, against environmentally destructive projects. Um, and these are things, you know, we've been kind of involved with in various degrees as a kind of, in a personal capacity as people who are kind of, um, you know, concerned about about the kind of impact of our work um, on biodiversity. Um, I think having said all that, um, it's also really not, not worth um, forgetting the impacts we can have kind of within the spaces of architectural design, as you kind of said. Um, you know, ultimately where we have a really unique agency is, is through the unique ownership of kind of design skills, of detailing of design, and, and the kind of professional roles that come with that. Um, and all of those actions can be more or less extractive, more or less generous to the lives of other than humans. Um, and that was really a basis, I guess, for, for setting out on this research was to see kind of what can we do in terms of architectural knowledge, in terms of what, what other worlds are there out there for kind of mm -hmm. precedence for architectural design and how we approach architectural design. Um, and in that way, it kind of did set out something of a, something of a manifesto, but also looking for these kind of um, in a way, a knowledge base and a resource. Um, and I wouldn't say it's a knowledge base in terms of generating kind of general rules or general practices that can be applied kind of universally. Um, as we saw in each case study we presented, they're kind of really specific and they're not non-transferable. Mm -hmm. um, they're specific to the kind of distinct ecology of their context. Um, but the power is in those kind of, the kind of rush of stories of saying, um, you know, that these are kind of different paradigms to work towards. And those kind of open up new kind of new paths um, towards more attentive ways of, of practicing, more attentive ways of kind of translating design decisions, um, materialities, and construction details with the kind of you know what what do the what impact do these things have beyond kind of the traditional human spheres that we think that they impact? Um, yeah, and I guess ultimately, yeah, uh, if we're aware of kind of the the wider impacts of construction. Um, if we're aware that they're so great, you know, sort of the, the oft quoted, it's like 40% of carbon emissions um, linked to the construction sector. Yeah. Um, 
there's an enormous agency and kind of positive change that we start, just start to tackle the work that we do. Right. Yeah, and to kind of another angle, um, the Desk Gupta Review, um, which is a recent report on the economics of biodiversity, um, that makes the point that physical detachment from nature has led to a decline in emotional attachment. Um, and this, mm -hmm. they see this as a fundamental reason for our complacency in the biodiversity crisis. And, you know, connection with nature needs to be woven throughout our lives um, from an early age um, in order to inspire action. And so when architects are engaging in, you know, ecologically led practice, um, they're not just producing um, architectures which, which work, you know, in harmony with the ecological specificities of their sites. Um, but we're actually, we have a bit more power than that, you know, we're articulating, you know, new novel forms of multi-species cohabitation. And we really got the potential to redress detachment from nature. And, you know, inspire a future generation of you know ethical citizens and practitioners amazing I think, sorry i might just jump in oh yeah can you hear me okay yeah yeah can hear you i just wanted to add to beth and james i think um what you said at the end there beth is like like aspirational as to what we should be trying to do and i was really glad that james mentioned the architectural workers um component of all this because architecture is like really hard and to be told as an architect, like, oh, here's another thing you have to do yeah. um, is a bit, it's asking for a lot because, you know, I mean, we all work impossible hours and ridiculous deadlines. And if it was just another commitment we had to do, I don't think it would um, have the same effect as, as what you mentioned, James, about like um, acknowledging we are workers and we have agency mm -hmm. together. Um, that sort of goes against the history of architecture as like a liberal, entrepreneurial, gentlemanly profession where you kind of, you know, sell whatever's on the table, you know, just to get the next job. Um, so, so there has to be a kind of the both, like um, what kind of jobs do we want to do? And when can we withdraw our labor to make sure that, you know, that we're doing the right thing when it comes to that. Um, it's not all in our, in our hands, obviously, as if we just think of ourselves as architects, because other systems are kind of doing us all the time. We aren't really in control. And I would just also add, I think as a designer, it, it's it's so not a chore to do all these things. It makes architecture um, so much more exciting and richer in meaning. And um, yeah, it's yeah. it's a really exciting future ahead. It's not, <clears throat> yeah, it's not at all. Just like, yeah, another thing to add to the list. A layer, yeah, it's sort of the core. Yeah. It, it is the core of something really exciting. And um, yeah, I, I find yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the notion of theme and uh, well, the notion and theme of care has been very prevalent considering, I mean, the likes of the pandemic and ecological crisis, such as the bushfires in both California and Australia that happened in 2020 and 2019. So what steps do you think need to be taken within the architecture and construction industry in order to secure biodiversity within spaces inhabited by humans where we can all live together? Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about this a little bit because I've been working on a project in a, in a bushfire zone where um, the 2019-2020 bushfires in New South Wales kind of um, cleared the site completely. And now there's all this effort to rebuild um, homes within these zones that were basically burned out. Um, and I, I just find it really fascinating the kinds of contradictions that emerge when you're trying to build homes in these um, landscapes that really co-evolved just to burn. Yeah. There are all these like legislative um, hindrances that, that basically ensure that if you want to live um, where there's any flammable mass, like any vegetative growth, you have to commit to clearing all of that basically up until a certain, basically to the extents of your boundary. So they're called like, um, I'm working on a, a house right now in, in New South, Southern New South Wales. Yeah. And they're called these, you have to create an asset protection zone, um, which is like um, basically enshrining and legislation that you'll clear all of the natural vegetation to the extent of your site so that your house will be safe. So is it like um, a buffer and, zone essentially between your yeah, house and, so, and the vegetation? And it, you know, the opportunity of like the, the ecology that burns, there could be so many exciting ways, like performative and metabolic ways to design your life around this landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but instead the, the effect of all this legislation is that you just build basically a concrete bunker or something that won't burn and then clear the site uh, of any type of growth. It's, it's really backwards, I think. How large, how large of, is this um, kind of 
buffer zone, let's say. Yeah, there, yeah, there are different ratios. Like there's one that's like the 10 to 50 ratio. So if you have 10% um, of your site has to be cleared around the house and then there's 50% of the site up till the next um, sort of forest or uh, shrub growth. Mm -hmm. It's like a weird set of metrics that is sort of out of date after the bushfires really cleared everything. Okay. Um, but it's kind of the logical conclusion of, of thinking about private property over everything else. Like, you know, yeah. your asset is the most important thing and all of this other life is um, secondary to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a clearing of all these non-human patterns that could form like the basis of a really exciting, you know, social dimension to living in a landscape that, that should burn. Um, so there are like huge opportunities to think in more exciting ways about communal burning patterns, um, given that like bushfires are going to be part of our uh, future inevitably in, at least in um, Australia and California. Yeah. I was listening to an amazing podcast. Uh, uh, it's called Future Ecologies. And there was an episode on this concept of what they called combustible communities. So it's all about yeah. centering. So rather than like the individual asset model where you yeah. care about your house and nothing else, you kind of center um, fire and energy as like the basis of a social um, relationship. Mm -hmm. So you, you would go around as a community and do prescribed burnings to make sure that um, fuel isn't growing. And you would totally disregard the kinds of arbitrary individual boundary lines that form, you know, private property in the bush. Yes, but basically. it kind of also becomes like a social practice as well, like a collective community thing that everyone kind of takes care of the environment together. Yeah, and obviously fire has been so essential for millennia to the way landscapes are uh, maintained and controlled. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like such a missed opportunity there. So that's one way. The other thing I was thinking of is like, I wasn't in Sydney when the, the bushfires um, happened in 2019 and 2020, but you've seen all these images and heard all these stories about smog and smoke completely enveloping um, cities. And I, I just can't stop thinking about like the, what was burning wasn't, pristine nature by any means like it wasn't untouched yeah. uh, areas of, of forest and soil and uh, it was all the houses and all the you know artificial materials that came in um, that were burned and came into the cities and then like started to enter into our bodies so I'm just thinking what if we started thinking about building materials on the basis of their uh, inevitable like decomposition and, and uh, consumption by, by us humans like could there be a new metabolic like contract between you know, what we're building, knowing that it might burn and dissolve and be absorbed in our bodies in ways we don't understand, mm -hmm. you know, how would we outfit our homes uh, with that in mind, knowing that it's going to be us or like future generations that have to literally ingest our decisions, you know, today. Yeah, that's a really interesting kind of thought to think of this kind of constant cycle. Um, so the case studies focus on multi species cohabitation at the scale of the building or the domestic. Um, have you as a collective started to think about this notion of collective care of humans and other than humans, but that transcends the scale to maybe the scale of like territories and geographies and what would this look like? <laughs> so um, you definitely got us there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, we, we have started um, and we were like talking about aquacultures and polycultures and I think for the sort of first stage we, we focused on on buildings because they're they're a bit more easy to draw that they're, they're, they're just um um yeah they tell really compelling stories i guess but what i what we sort of would say to that is that um even if they're a small scale uh, sort of event or or um sort of example they sort of completely um manifest the, the entanglement that those buildings have with the wider ecology and, and weather system so for example um the Kabata, um, you know, the, the residents of Haria in, in, in Japan have, have, are so attentive to the way they treat water because they know it's sort of part of this wider landscape um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of read um, system and, and, and sort of people are suddenly become more aware of the way they're entangled with the, the, the animal or, or species they cohabit with, but also, you know, how they are part of a wider system. And I think what's also the most interesting thing about all these examples is that they um, sort of are not a fruit of a top-down ecological practice. They are very um, sort of matter-of-fact. Um, most of them are farming systems. They, they're not um, 
I guess what I would say, they're not particularly intellectualized from, from their conception, um, which I think is <laughs> why it's so, they're, they're so interesting and so powerful because they're just a, um, I guess the fruit of a commitment between uh, a people and uh, a series of species. And that makes them um, just so much more compelling, I think. Um, and perhaps um, that's what we can learn from the most. It's, sort of, it's, it's more of a, an effort we can make to, to, to a better future. I think also maybe like reconsidering the boundaries of we, what we define as architecture or building isn't just the physical parameters of the kind of structure itself, but as you mm. a Japanese case study with the notion of the water, like, yes, it does interact with the house or the building, but like the water as a body is way more expansive. Yeah, yeah and the same with the dovecotes, uh, you know, the, the, the birds are, live on those islands and feed of fish, which is sort of directly, you know, in front of that building in, in, mm -hmm. in the islands. But um, of course, the food that the birds feed on is, is um, part of a much wider um, system. And, and I guess we don't, particularly mention that specifically, but it's sort of always the background of our thinking mm -hmm. to add to that. But, uh. Yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned the word boundary and that that is a way a really key concept when we're talking about the boundary between architecture and say nature that's been really ingrained in the profession for, yeah. uh, you know, from its conception almost. Um, and similarly, we've kind of, we can translate that across to developments in Sort of medical science say where we're increasingly realizing that the human body is not a kind of contiguous um you know uh, uh component in itself that goes through the world unencumbered by the things that it um, touches it's sort of multi-species and it's very sort of fabric we dependent on many other um organisms to to kind of um, live and our skin is permeable and we, as matthew said kind of we absorb pollutants we are our environment <laughs> and it's like it's really seeing that the kind of the, the the permeability of those boundaries between what we define as a kind of human species what we define as other what we define you know all, the, all of these things are not are not sort of set boundaries and that's kind of really inspiring thing for us is to think of architecture in a similar way of what if we really kind of hone in on on what we define as boundaries what, what how can those boundaries be expanded to be kind of more, more generous to other species how can they become you know, and, and that's that's a kind of we looked here at the building scale a little bit so so the kind of birds say pigeons that live in a kind of boundary wall and this kind of thing mm -hmm. or um but also again the kind of the territorial um factor was kind of a territorial boundary and how that how those boundaries can um between kind of you know political divisions or whatever often end up being sites of generosity um and that's something that this research didn't quite enter into, but it's definitely kind of something that it speaks about as Enrico says yeah. through through kind of building building details. Um, so showcasing these case studies, there is a theme of sh shifting the viewpoint away from the anthropocentric to a more inclusive form where we can think to design more collectively for not only humans, but also to foster interspecies relationships. So what else do you hope people take away or implement into their own practices when they see these case studies articulating these relationships between humans and other than humans? Yeah, so, so for me, I think a limit of this research is, is actually putting too much focus on the human and non-human relationships and not enough on simply um, human relationships. Uh, you know, extractive human-human relationships tend to preclude any meaningful multi-species relationships anyway. So like, yeah, not, not losing sight of the human and all this is really interesting and important. I've also been thinking about this, um, having returned to Australia um, at the end of last year. Um, you know, the story of Australian settlement is really instructive in this regard because Indigenous and First Nations people, they were considered flora and fauna to colonists. You know, that's how they legitimized their violent settlements and removal. It's like these are non-humans. So it's almost offensive to ask of people who are not even considered humans to all of a sudden become post-human, which is what the kind of non-humanism term is kind of suggesting. So it ignores this violence of, of what uh, an academic called Mel Chen calls the animacy hierarchy. You know, the idea that some humans are more human than others, which is a, a very pervasive and um, prominent form of white supremacy, basically, that says some humans are other and some are non-humans. And right now, I think there's a possibility um, 
where we're seeing this incredible potential for the Black Lives Matter movement and climate justice to kind of converge. Um, so I would hope that like practices that are trying to be more inclusive or more attentive to um, non-human agency and species can like um, commit to these larger uh, movements that elevate all forms of non-extractive relationships and practices, um, some that predate European colonization in many parts of the world. So I think I think we're excited to use like our privilege as architects and spatial creative and material thinkers to work productively with really big challenging problems like climate breakdown and you know racial capitalism like things we could never if we weren't being creative about like we could never possibly deal with they're just too depressing and overwhelming. Um, so I think I think yeah we're willing to to fail testing these ideas and, and creating possibilities for you know, better ways of doing the built environment. Um, and, and that's what's exciting. Like we're trying to recover non-extractive ways to produce space, um, but without losing sight of these like bigger agendas of basically equity and living in a very connected, um, yeah, global society, which we do. Amazing, thank you. There's so many thought provoking kind of elements that you've brought into the discussion. Um, thank you, Thera Partnerships, for joining us at the Non-Extractive Architecture Residency, and we will be uploading this into the blog, and it will be available for people to see live. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.